Now the gods at the side of Zeus were sitting in council over the golden floor, and among them the goddess Hebe poured the nectar as wine, while they in the golden drinking cups drank to each other, gazing down on the city of the Trojans. Presently the son of Kronos was minded to anger Hera, if he could, with words offensive, speaking to cross her. Two among the goddesses stand by Menelaos, Hera of Argos, and Athena who stands by her people. Yet see, here they are sitting apart, looking on at the fighting, and take their pleasure. Meanwhile, laughing Aphrodite forever stands by her man and drives the spirits of death away from him. Even now she has rescued him when he thought he would perish. So the victory now is with warlike Menelaos. Let us consider then how these things shall be accomplished, whether again to stir up grim warfare and the terrible fighting, or cast down love and make them friends with each other. If somehow this way could be sweet and pleasing to all of us, the city of Lord Priam might still be a place men dwell in, and Menelaus could take away with him Helen of Argos. So he spoke, and Athena and Hera muttered, since they were sitting close to each other, devising evil for the Trojans. Still, Athena stayed silent and said nothing, but only sulked at Zeus, her father, and savage anger took hold of her. But the heart of Hera could not contain her anger, and she spoke forth, Majesty, son of Kronos, what sort of thing have you spoken? How can you wish to make wasted and fruitless all this endeavor, the sweat that I have sweated in toil, and my horses worn out gathering my people and bringing evil to Priam and his children? Do it, then, but not all the rest of us gods will approve you. Deeply troubled, Zeus, who gathers the clouds, answered her, Dear lady, what can be all the great evils done to you by Priam and the sons of Priam that you are thus furious forever to bring down the strong-founded city of Ilion? If you could walk through the gates and through the towering ramparts and eat Priam and the children of Priam raw and the other Trojans, then, then only might you glut at last your anger. Do as you please then. Never let this quarrel hereafter be between you and me a bitterness for both of us, and put away in your thoughts this other thing that I tell you. Whenever I, in turn, am eager to lay waste some city as I please, one in which are dwelling men who are dear to you, you shall not stand in the way of my anger, but let me do it. Since I was willing to grant you this wish with my heart unwilling. For of all the cities beneath the sun and the starry heaven, dwelt in by men who live upon the earth, there has never been one honored nearer to my heart than sacred Ilion and Priam, and the people of Priam of the strong ash spear. Never yet has my altar gone without fair sacrifice the libation and the savor, since this is our portion of honor. Then the goddess the oxide, Lady Hera, answered, Of all cities there are three that are dearest to my own heart, Argos and Sparta and Mukenai of the wide ways. All these, whenever they become hateful to your heart, sack utterly. I will not stand up for these against you, nor yet begrudge you. Yet if even so I bear malice and would not have you destroy them, in malice I will accomplish nothing, since you are far stronger. Yet my labor also should not be let go unaccomplished. I am likewise a god, and my race is even what yours is, and I am first of the daughters of Devious devising Kronos. Both ways since I am eldest born and am called your consort, yours and you in turn are lord over all the immortals. Come then, in this thing let us both give way to each other, I to you, 
you to me, and so the rest of the immortal gods will follow. Now in speed, give orders to Athena to visit horrible war again on Achaeans and Trojans, and try to make it so that the Trojans are first offenders to do injury against the oaths to the far-famed Achaeans. She spoke. Nor did the father of gods and men disobey her, but immediately he spoke in winged words to Athena, Go now, swiftly to the host of the Achaeans and Trojans, and try to make it so that the Trojans are first defenders to do injury against the oaths to the far-famed Achaeans. Speaking so, he stirred up Athena, who was eager before this. And she went in a flash of speed down the pinnacles of Olympus, as when the son of Devius devising Kronos cast down a star portent to sailors, or to widespread armies of peoples, glittering and thickly the sparks of fire break from it. In such likeness, Pallas Athena swept flashing earthward, and plunged between the two hosts, and amazement seized the beholders, Trojans, breakers of horses, and strong reaped the Kians. And thus they would speak to each other, each looking at the man next him. Surely again there will be evil war and terrible fighting, or else now friendship is being set between both sides by Zeus, who is appointed lord of the wars of mortals. Thus would murmur any man, Achaean or Trojan. She in the likeness of a man merged among the Trojans assembled, Laodokos, Antenor's son, a powerful spearman, searching for godlike Pandaros, if she might somewhere come on him. She found the son of Lycaon, a man blameless and powerful, standing still, and about him were the ranks of strong shield-armored people who had followed him from the streams of Isepos. Speaking in winged words, she stood beside him and spoke to him. Why, son of Lycaon, would you now let me persuade you? So you might dare send a flying arrow against Menelaus and win you glory and gratitude in the sight of all Trojans, particularly beyond all else with Prince Alexandros. Beyond all beside, you would carry away glorious gifts from him were he to see warlike Menelaus, the son of Atreus, struck down by your arrow and laid on the sorrowful corpse fire, come then, let go an arrow against haughty Menelaus. But make your prayer to Apollo the Lightborn, the glorious archer, that you will accomplish a grand sacrifice of lambs firstborn when you come home again to the city of sacred Zelea. So spoke Athena, and persuaded the fool's heart in him. Straightway he unwrapped his bow of the polished horn from a running wild goat he himself had shot in the chest once, lying in wait for the goat in a covert as it stepped down from the rock and hit it in the chest so it sprawled on the boulders. The horns that grew from the goat's head were sixteen palms length. A bowyer working on the horn then bound them together, smoothing them to a fair surface, and put on a golden string hook. Pandaros strung his bow and put it in position, bracing it against the ground, and his brave friends held their shields in front of him for fear the warlike sons of the Achaeans might rise up and rush him before he had struck warlike Menelaus, the son of Atreus. He stripped away the lid of the quiver and took out an arrow feathered and never shot before, transmitter of dark pain. Swiftly he arranged the bitter arrow along the bowstring and made his prayer to Apollo the Lightborn, the glorious archer, that he would accomplish a grand sacrifice of lambs firstborn when he came home again to the city of sacred Zelea. He drew 
holding at once the grooves and the ox hide bowstring and brought the string against his nipple iron to the bow stave. But when he had pulled the great weapon till it made a circle, the bow groaned and the string sang high and the arrow sharp pointed leapt away furious to fly through the throng before it. Still the blessed gods immortal did not forget you, Menelaos, and first among them Zeus's daughter, the spoiler, who standing in front of you fended aside the tearing arrow. She brushed it away from his skin as lightly as when a mother brushes a fly away from her child who is lying in sweet sleep steering herself the arrow's course straight to where the golden belt buckles joined and the halves of his corslet were fitted together. The bitter arrow was driven against the joining of the war belt and passed clean through the war belt elaborately woven. Into the elaborately woven corslet the shaft was driven and the guard which he wore to protect his skin and keep the spears off which guarded him best, yet the arrow plunged even through this also, and with the very tip of its point grazed the man's skin, and straightway from the cut there gushed a cloud of dark blood, as when some Myonian woman or Carian, with purple colors ivory to make it a cheek piece for horses, it lies away in an inner room, and many a rider longs to have it, but it is laid up to be a king's treasure. Two things, to be the beauty of the horse, the pride of the horseman. So, Menelaos, your shapely thighs were stained with the color of blood, and your legs also and the ankles beneath them. Agamemnon, the lord of men, was taken with shuddering fear as he saw how from the cut the dark blood trickled downward and Menelaos the warlike himself shuddered in terror. But when he saw the binding strings and the hooked barbs outside the wound, his spirit was gathered again back into him. Agamemnon the powerful spoke to them, groaning heavily, and by the hand held Menelaos while their companions were mourning beside them. Dear brother, it was your death I sealed in the oaths of friendship, setting you alone before the Achaeans to fight with the Trojans. So the Trojans have struck you down and trampled on the oaths sworn. Still the oaths and the blood of the lambs shall not be called vain, the unmixed wine poured, and the right hands we trusted. If the Olympian at once has not finished this matter, late he will bring it to pass, and they must pay a great penalty with their own heads, and with their women, and with their children. For I know this thing well in my heart, and my mind knows it. There will come a day when sacred Ilion shall perish. And Priam, and the people of Priam, of the strong ash spear, and Zeus, son of Kronos, who sits on high, the sky-dwelling himself shall shake the gloom of his aegis over all of them in anger for this deception. All this shall not go unaccomplished, but I shall suffer a terrible grief for you, Menelaus, if you die and fill out the destiny of your lifetime. And I must return a thing of reproach to Argos, the thirsty, for now at once the Achaeans will remember the land of their fathers. And thus we would leave to Priam and to the Trojans, Helen of Argos, to glory over while the bones of you rot in the plowland as you lie dead in Troy on a venture that went unaccomplished. And thus shall some Trojan speak in the proud show of his manhood. Leaping lightly as he speaks on the tomb of great Menelaus, might Agamemnon accomplish his anger thus against all his enemies, as now he led here in vain a host of Achaeans, and has gone home again to the beloved land of his fathers with ships empty and leaving behind him brave Menelaos? 
Thus shall a man speak. Then let the wide earth open to take me. Then in encouragement, fair-haired Menelaus spoke to him. Do not fear, nor yet make afraid the Achaean people. The sharp arrow is not stuck in a mortal place, but the shining war belt turned it aside from its course, and the flap beneath it with my guard of armor that bronze smiths wrought carefully for me. Then an answer again spoke powerful Agamemnon, May it only be as you say, O Menelaus, dear brother, but the physician will handle the wound and apply over it healing salves by which he can put an end to the black pains. He spoke and addressed Talthibios, his sacred herald. Talthibios, with all speed, go call hither Machaon, a man who is son of Asclepius and a blameless physician, so that he may look at Menelaus, the warlike son of Atreus, whom someone skilled in the bow's use shot with an arrow, Trojan or Lycian, Glory to him, but to us, a sorrow. He spoke, and the herald heard and did not disobey him, but went on his way among the host of bronze-armored Achaeans, looking about for the warlike Machaon, and saw him standing still, and about him the strong ranks of shield-bearing people who had come with him from horse-pasturing Trika. He came and stood close beside him and addressed him in winged words, Rise up, son of Asclepius. Powerful Agamemnon calls you, so that you may look at warlike Menelaus, the Achaean's leader, whom someone skilled in the bow's use shot with an arrow, Trojan or Lycian, glory to him, but to us, a sorrow. So he spoke and stirred up the spirit within Machaon. They went through the crowd along the widespread host of the Achaeans, but when they had come to the place where fair-haired Menelaus had been hit, where all the great men were gathered about him in a circle, and he stood in the midst of them, a man godlike, straightway he pulled the arrow forth from the joining of the war belt, and as it was pulled out, the sharp barbs were broken backwards. He slipped open the war belt then, and the flap beneath it, with the guard of armor that bronze smiths wrought carefully for him. But when he saw the wound where the bitter arrow was driven, he sucked the blood and in skill laid healing medicines on it, that Chiron, in friendship, long ago had given his father. While they were working over Menelaus of the great war cry, all this time came on the ranks of the armored Trojans. The Achaeans again put on their armor and remembered their warcraft. Then you would not have seen brilliant Agamemnon asleep, nor skulking aside, nor in any way a reluctant fighter, but driving eagerly toward the fighting where men win glory, he left aside his chariot gleaming with bronze and his horses, and these, breathing hard, were held aside by a henchman, Eurymedon, born to Ptolemaios, the son of Peraios. Agamemnon told him to keep them well in hand till the time came when weariness might take hold of his limbs through marshalling so many. Then he, on foot as he was, ranged through the ranks of his fighters, those of the fast-mounted Danaans he found eager. He would stand beside these and urge them harder on with words spoken. Argives, do not let go now of this furious valor. Zeus the father shall not be one to give aid to liars, but these who were the first to do violence over the oath sworn, vultures shall feed upon the delicate skin of their bodies while we lead away their beloved wives and innocent children in our ships after we have stormed their citadel. Any he might see hanging back from the hateful conflict, these in words of anger he would reproach very bitterly. Argives, you arrow fighters, have you no shame, you abuses? Why are you simply standing there bewildered like young deer who, after they are tired from running through a great meadow, stand there still, and there is no heart of courage within them? Thus are you standing still bewildered and are not fighting. Or are you waiting for the Trojans to come close? Whether strong stern ships have been hauled up along the strand of the Grey Sea, so you may know if Kronos' son will hold his hand over you. Thus he raged through the ranks of his men, and set them in order. On his way through the thronging men he came to the Cretans, who about valiant Idomeneus were arming for battle. Idomeneus, like a boar in his strength, stood among the champions, while Meriones still urged along the last battalions. 
Agamemnon, the lord of men, was glad as he looked at them and in words of graciousness at once spoke to Idomeneus. I honor you, Idomeneus, beyond the fast-mounted Danaans, whether in battle or in any action, whatever. Whether it be at the feast when the great men of the Argives blend in the mixing bowl the gleaming wine of the princes, even though all the rest of the flowing Herdikians drink out their portion, still your cup stands filled forever, even as mine. For you to drink when the pleasure takes you, rise up then to battle such as you claimed in time past. Then in turn, Idomeneus, lord of the Cretans, answered him, Son of Atreus, I will in truth be a staunch companion in arms, as first I promised you and bent my head to it. Rouse up, rather, the rest of the flowing Herdikians, so that we may fight in all speed, since the Trojans have broken their oaths. A thing that shall be death and sorrow hereafter to them, since they were the first to do violence over the oaths sworn. So he spoke, and Atreides, cheerful at heart, went onward. On his way, through the thronging men, he came to the Iamtes. These were armed, and about them went a cloud of foot soldiers. As from his watching place a goat herd watches a cloud move on its way over the sea before the drive of the west wind. Far away though he be, he watches it, blacker than pitch is, moving across the sea and piling the storm before it. And as he sees it, he shivers and drives his flocks to a cavern. So about the two Iantes moved the battalions, close compacted of strong and god-supported young fighters, black and jagged with spear and shield to the terror of battle. Agamemnon, the lord of men, was glad when he looked at them, and he spoke aloud to them and addressed them in winged words. Iantes, O leaders of the bronze-armed Argives, to you too I give no orders. It would not become me to speed you. Now that yourselves drive your people on to fight strongly, Father Zeus and Athena and Apollo, if only such a spirit were in the hearts of all of my people, then perhaps the city of Lord Priam would be bent underneath our hands, captured and utterly taken. So he spoke and left them there and went among others. There he came upon Nestor, the lucid speaker of Pylos, setting in order his own companions and urging them to battle, tall Pelagon with those about him, Alastor and Chromios, Hymon the powerful and Bitos, shepherd of the people. First he ranged the mounted men with their horses and chariots and stationed the brave and numerous foot soldiers behind them to be the bastion of battle and drove the cowards to the center so that a man might be forced to fight even though unwilling. First he gave orders to the drivers of horses and warned them to hold their horses in check and not be fouled in the multitude. Let no man in the pride of his horsemanship and his manhood dare to fight alone with the Trojans in front of the rest of us. Neither let him give ground, since that way you will be weaker. When a man from his own car encounters the enemy chariots, let him stab with his spear, since this is the stronger fighting. So the men before your time sacked tower and city, keeping a spirit like this in their hearts, and like this their purpose. Thus the old man, wise in fighting from of old, encouraged them. Agamemnon, the lord of men, was glad when he looked at him, and he spoke aloud to him and addressed him in winged words. Aged sir, if only as the spirit is in your bosom, so might your knees be also, and the strength stay steady within you. But age weakens you, which comes to all. If only some other of the fighters had your age, and you were one of the young men. Nestor the Geranian horseman spoke, and answered him, Son of Atreus, so would I also wish to be that man I was, when I cut down brilliant Erothaleon. But the gods give to mortals not everything at the same time. If I was a young man then, now in turn old age is upon me. Yet even so I shall be among the riders, and command them with word and counsel, such is the privilege of the old men. The young spearmen shall do the spear fighting, 
those who are born of a generation later than mine, who trust in their own strain. So he spoke, and Atreides, cheerful at heart, went onward. He came on the son of Peteos, Menestheus, driver of horses, standing still, and about him the Athenians, urgent for battle. Next to these, resourceful Odysseus had taken position, and beside him the Cephalanian ranks, no weak ones, were standing, since the men had not heard the clamor of battle, but even now, fresh set in motion, moved the battalions of Achaeans and Trojans, breakers of horses. So these standing waited until some other mass of Achaeans advancing might crash against the Trojans and the battle be opened. Seeing these, the lord of men Agamemnon scolded them and spoke aloud to them and addressed them in winged words, saying, Son of Pateos, the king supported of God, and you too, you with your mind forever on profit and your ways of treachery, why do you stand here skulking aside and wait for the others? For you too, it is becoming to stand among the foremost fighters and endure your share of the blaze of battle, since indeed you too are first to hear of the feasting whenever we Achaeans make ready a feast of the princes. There it is your pleasure to eat the roast flesh, to drink as much as you please the cups of the wine that is sweet as honey. Now, though, you would be pleased to look on though ten battalions of Achaeans were to fight with the pitiless bronze before you. Then, looking at him darkly, resourceful Odysseus spoke to him. What is this word that broke through the fence of your teeth, Atreides? How can you say that? When we Achaeans waken the bitter war god on Trojans, breakers of horses, I hang back from fighting. Only watch if you care to, and if it concerns you. The very father of Telemachus locked with the champion Trojans, breakers of horses. Your talk is wind and no meaning. Powerful Agamemnon in turn answered him, laughing, seeing that he was angered, and taking back the words spoken. Son of Laertes and seed of Zeus, resourceful Odysseus, I must not be niggling with you, nor yet give you orders, since I know how the spirit in your secret heart knows ideas of kindness only, for what you think is what I think. Come now, I will make it good hereafter. If anything evil has been said, let the gods make all this come to nothing. So he spoke and left him there and went, among others. He came on the son of Tydeus, high-spirited Diomedes, standing among the compacted chariots and by the horses, and Capaneus' son, Stenelos, was standing beside him. At sight of Diomedes, the lord of men, Agamemnon scolded him and spoke aloud to him and addressed him in winged words, saying, Ah, me, son of Tydeus, that daring breaker of horses, why are you skulking and spying out the outworks of battle? Such was never Tydeus' way to lurk in the background, but to fight the enemy far ahead of his own companions. So they say, who had seen him at work, since I never saw nor encountered him ever, but they say he surpassed all others. Once on a time he came, but not in war, to Mukenai, with godlike Polynikes, a guest and a friend, assembling people, since these were attacking the sacred bastion of... Thebes, and much they entreated us to grant him renowned companions, and our men wished to give them, and were assenting to what they had asked for, but Zeus turned them back, showing forth portents that crossed them. Now, as these went forward, and were well on their way, and came to the river Asopos, and the meadows of grass, and the deep rushes, from there the Achaeans sent Tydeus ahead with a message. He went then and came on the Cadmians in their numbers, feasting all about the home of mighty Ateocles. There, stranger though he was, the driver of horses, Tydeus, was not frightened, alone among so many Cadmians, but dared them to try their strength with him, and bested all of them easily. Such might did Pallas Athena give him. The Cadmians, who lashed their horses in anger, compacted an ambushard of guile on his way home, assembling together fifty fighting men, and for these there were two leaders, Myon, Hymen's son, in the likeness of the immortals, with the son of Altophonos, Polyphontes, stubborn in battle. On these men, Tadeus let loose a fate that was shameful. He killed them all, except that he let one man get home again, letting Myon go in obedience to the gods' signs. This was Tydeus, the Aetolian, 
Yet he was father to a son worse than himself at fighting, better in conclave. So he spoke, and strong Diomedes gave no answer. In awe, before the majesty of the king's rebuking. But the son of Capaneus the glorious answered him, saying, Son of Atreus, do not lie when you know the plain truth. We too claim we are better men by far than our fathers. We did storm the seven-gated foundation of Thebes, though we led fewer people beneath a wall that was stronger. We obeyed the signs of the gods and the help Zeus gave us, while those others died of their own headlong stupidity. Therefore, never liken our fathers to us in honor. Then, looking at him darkly, strong Diomedes spoke to him. Friend, stay quiet, rather, and do as I tell you. I will find no fault with Agamemnon, shepherd of the people, for stirring thus into battle the strong-grieved Achaeans. This will be his glory to come if ever the Achaeans cut down the men of Troy and capture sacred Ilion. If the Achaeans are slain, then his will be the great sorrow. Come, let you and me remember our fighting courage. He spoke and leapt in all his gear to the ground from his chariot, and the bronze armor girt to the chest of the king clashed terribly as he sprang. Fear would have gripped even a man stout-hearted. Along the thundering beach, the surf of the sea strikes beat upon beat as the west wind drives it onward, far out cresting first on the open water. It drives thereafter to smash, roaring along the dry land, and against the rock jut bending breaks itself into crests, spewing back the salt wash. So thronged beat upon beat the Danaan's close battalions steadily into battle, with each of the lords commanding his own men. And these went silently. You would not think all these people with voices kept in their chests were marching silently in fear of their commanders and upon all glittered as they marched the shining armor they carried. But the Trojans, as sheep in a man of possessions studding, stand in their myriads waiting to be drained of their white milk and bleat interminably as they hear the voice of their lambs. So the crying of the Trojans went up through the wide army, since there was no speech nor language common to all of them. But their talk was mixed, who were called there from many far places. Ares drove these on, the Achaeans' grey-eyed Athena, and terror drove them, and fear, and hate whose wrath is relentless. She the sister and companion of murderous Ares, she who is only a little thing at the first, but thereafter grows until she strides on the earth with her head striking heaven. She then hurled down bitterness equally between both sides as she walked through the onslaught, making men's pain heavier. Now as these advancing came to one place and encountered, they dashed their, they dashed their shields, their together, shields together, and their and together and their spears. And the, the strength, strength of armored, armored men, men in bronze, in bronze and, the and the shields massive in the middle, in the clashed, middle against against clashed against each other. Against each other. The sound grew huge the sound of the fighting. Huge of the there fighting. the screaming and the shouts of there triumph the rose up and together. The shouts of triumph of men rose killing up together. and men killed. Of men killing and men killed. blood. As when rivers in winter spate, running down from the mountains, throw together at the meeting of streams the weight of their water out of the great springs behind in the hollow stream bed, and far away in the mountains the shepherd hears their thunder. Such, from the coming together of men, was the shock and the shouting. Antilochus was first to kill a chief man of the Trojans, valiant among the champions, Thalysias' son, Echepolos. Throwing first, he struck the horn of the horse-haired helmet, and the bronze spear point fixed in his forehead and drove inward through the bone and a mist of darkness clouded both eyes. 
and he fell as a tower falls in the strong encounter. As he dropped, Elephenor the powerful caught him by the feet, Chalcodon's son and lord of the great-hearted Abantes, and dragged him away from under the missiles, striving in all speed to strip the armor from him. Yet his outrush went short-lived, for as he hauled the corpse, high-hearted Agenor, marking the ribs that showed bare under the shield as he bent over, stabbed with a bronze-pointed spear and unstrung his sinews. So the spirit left him, and over his body was fought out weary work by Trojans and Achaeans who like wolves sprang upon one another with man against man in the onfall. There, Telamonian Ias struck down the son of Anthemion, Simoesios, in his stripling's beauty, whom once his mother, descending from Ida, bore beside the banks of Simoes, when she had followed her father and mother to tend the sheep flocks. Therefore, they called him Simoesios, but he could not render again the care of his dear parents. He was short-lived, beaten down beneath the spear of high-hearted Ayas, who struck him as he first came forward beside the nipple of the right breast, and the bronze spearhead drove clean through the shoulder. He dropped then to the ground in the dust, like some black poplar, which in the land low-lying about a great marsh grows smooth-trimmed, yet with branches growing at the uttermost treetop one whom a man, a maker of chariots, fells with the shining iron to bend it into a wheel for a fine wrought chariot. And the tree lies hardening by the banks of a river. Such was Anthemeon's son, Simoesios, whom illustrious Aias killed. Now Antiphos of the shining corslet, Priam's son, made a cast at him in the crowd with a sharp spear, but missed Aias and struck Laukos, a brave companion of Odysseus, in the groin as he dragged a corpse off, so that the body dropped from his hand as he fell above it. For his killing, Odysseus was stirred to terrible anger, and he strode out among the champions, helmed in bright bronze, and stood close to the enemy, hefting the shining javelin, glaring round about him, and the Trojans gave way in the face of the man throwing with the spear, and he made no vain cast, but struck down Demokoon, the son of Priam, a bastard who came over from Abydos and left his fast-running horses. Odysseus struck him with the spear in anger for his companion in the temple, and the bronze spearhead drove through the other temple also, so that a mist of darkness clouded both eyes. He fell thunderously, and his armor clattered upon him. The champions of Troy gave back then, and glorious Hector, and the Argives gave a great cry and dragged back the bodies and drove their way forward. But now Apollo, watching from high Pergamos, was angered and called aloud to the Trojans. Rise, 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 rise. Trojans, Trojans. Yes. breakers, breakers of, horses. of horses. Bend not from battle with these Argives. Surely their skin is not stone, not iron to stand up under the tearing edge of the bronze as it strikes them. No, nor is Achilles the child of lovely-haired Thetis fighting, but beside the ship mulls his, his heart, heart sore, sore anger. anger. So called the fearful god from the citadel while Zeus's daughter, Tritogeneia, goddess most high, drove on the Achaeans, any of them she saw hanging back as she strode through the battle. Now his doom caught fast, Amering Kel's son Diores, who with a jagged boulder was smitten beside the ankle in the right shin, and a lord of the Thracian warriors threw it, Peiros, son of Imbrazos, who had journeyed from Ainos. The pitiless stone smashed utterly the tendons on both sides with the bones, and he was hurled into the dust backwards, reaching out both hands to his own beloved companions. Gasping life out, the stone's thrower ran up beside him, Peiros, and stabbed with his spear next to the navel, and all his guts poured out on the ground, 
and a mist of darkness closed over both eyes. Thoas the Aetolian hit Peros as he ran backward with a spear in the chest above the nipple and the bronze point fixed in the lung and Thoas standing close dragged out the heavy spear from his chest and drawing his sharp sword struck him in the middle of the belly and so took the life from him yet did not strip his armor for his companions about him stood Thracians with hair grown at the top gripping their long spears and though he was a mighty man and a strong and proud one thrust him from them so that he gave ground backward staggering so in the dust these two lay sprawled beside one another lords the one of the thracians the other of the bronze armored epeans and many others beside were killed all about them and there no more could a man who was in that work make light of it one who still unhit and still unstabbed by the sharp bronze spun in the midst of that fighting with Pallas Athena's hold on his hand guiding him driving back the volleying spears thrown for on that day many men of the Achaeans and Trojans lay sprawled in the dust face downward beside one another. End of book four. <laughs>